first introduce to you our first panelist. Um, Brian Carter attended the Juilliard School and has performed with such notable artists as Clark Terry, McCoy Tyner, Whit Marcellus, Marcus Roberts, Kenny Barron, Michael Feinstein, and Kurt Elling, as well as headlining his own band, uh, The Young Swingers, which I believe he is repping. Or no, that's not his shirt. Is oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, he is repping it on his shirt tonight. Uh, He's also served as the house drummer for NBC's Maya and Marty, starring Maya Rudolph, Kenan Thompson, and Martin Short. Brian has conducted clinics and workshops at schools, colleges, and universities around the world, and is a founding teaching artist for Jazz at Lincoln Center's Jazz for Young People program. Uh, so welcome, Brian. So great to have you. Um, and I'm going to turn things over to you to get us started. Thanks, Andy. Um, I totally didn't realize I was wearing the shirt, but I'm glad that I am. Um, Hi, everybody. I hope you're well. Um, I thought that I would um, play for you uh, a song that I just wrote uh, this past summer um, entitled Dear Blue. Um, it was a song that I wrote uh, at the beginning of the summer, uh, I think in, in June, um, during you know all of the chaos and, and madness uh, happening in New York City where there were kind of these... Uh, daily protests and then you know covid and uh the curfew <laughs> um and i was leaving a protest and i went to the grocery store picked up some dinner i was coming home and i uh, walked by this group of police officers and you know i was extremely polite to them and as i was walking away one of the police police officers just like pushed me to the ground and like my groceries are uh rolling down the street and my knee is banged up and people are just like oh my god what's going on um and yeah i was really upset and so i came home and i <laughs> wrote a song that was originally just for me and i actually sent it to lucas and roxy and i was like i don't know if i should <laughs> release this and Ro and roxy actually i'm not just saying this roxy literally texted me and was like you have to like you have to do this you have to release the song and so that's how it was born. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of it for you now, and then I'll kind of walk you through, um, I guess, within just, uh, you know, one, not, have, not having the ability. What I would usually do is just, like, call, you know, 30 of my friends <laughs> and go into the studio and flush this out. But, you know, being in quarantine and having, you know, all the studios be closed, you know, being restricted to making this, uh, in our respective, you know, bedroom apartment studios, uh, with extremely limited resources and uh, just a handful of people. So, without further ado, I'm gonna try to share my screen and hope, hope for the best. Hope it works. Let's see. Dear Blue, it's me. Don't want to fight. Please read. I thought I'd write to you and share my point of view. No, don't you cry for me. Please wipe your eyes and see my blackness clearly. No, I never caused any pain. To you, dear blue, I see your light, I know the drill, my eyes out, hands on the wheel for you, dear blue. Dear blue, 
So that is the song. Um, so going into writing this song, you know, you're kind of like usual, <laughs> your usual approach to a song about like being assaulted by a police officer, like literally a day after it happened. You know, you usually think that you want to go in and write like this very angry um, song, you know, kind of like this, this F you, this manifesto. But that wasn't actually how I was feeling. I was feeling very, uh, I don't know, I guess I, I was feeling sad, uh, but just like the state of everything and, you know, just how much like animosity and how much anger there was, um, on kind of like both sides. Um, and then beyond that, I, you know, I, I felt really inspired and uplifted. I, I remember the day after that happened, you know, John Batiste had his march, I think it was like my eighth or ninth, eighth or ninth uh, march by that point, and just seeing a community of musicians, people who I hadn't seen since the beginning of COVID, us all coming together and, and taking to the streets with our instruments, you know, that was really, really inspiring. Um, and I think that had a lot to do uh, with kind of how the song turned out as well. Um, so if I open up the logic session, you know, uh, I guess first, if I if I look at the lyrics, like the concept of addressing the police officer in a letter came from this idea of like, you know, what if 
we lived in a world where after a police officer kills an unarmed, you know, black person, they have to receive a letter from them and they have to kind of like read and, and actually like internalize. It's not just, you know, this uh, demonization of a person or this, uh, this, this photo on the news. Like what if you actually had to, you know, read a letter, like a very personal letter from a person who's, you know, whose life you, you took away. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where it started. Uh, so the lyrics, you know, start off, Dear Blue, it's me. Don't want to fight, please read. I thought I'd write to you and share my point of view. No, don't you cry for me. Please wipe your eyes and see my blackness clearly. No, I never caused any pain or harm to you. Um, I just thought that was, that was really powerful. So I'm going to try to open up this logic session now. Uh, and now it's gone. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm so uh, illiterate with Zoom. All right, I think you can see this now. Cool. Um, so obviously the first element that we have here is just like the the voice Dear and the piano. Blue, it's me, don't want to fight. The piano is uh, being played really beautifully by Matisse Picard. You may have seen it earlier. But basically, I just sent the guys uh, in the band, uh, sorry, we just talked about this last time. I sent the musicians in the band <laughs> um, a lead sheet. Um, and from there, I just kind of like took their, what they were playing and I tried to assemb assemble it and uh, I guess kind of cut things, cut things up. So here we may have missed it, but like we have Matisse on uh, on piano, and then under it, I'm I'm playing synths to kind of add more textures and more sounds, um, and then also Armand Hirsch, who's the guitarist. I think he's been to Jazz St. Louis with Bobby McFerrin a few times. Um, he's playing, you know, guitar, and that element is added as well. Please wipe your eyes. So I'm just getting like very soft uh, textures, which you probably won't even notice if you're just listening to it. I see your light. I know the drill. My ID's out, hands on the wheel for you. So here, um, I was trying to think of like, how do I kind of add more life to this lyric when I start, you know, describing what actually happened, uh, you know, in this fictional story before the police officer has like this dangerous encounter, you know, the, the character, the, the person who's writing the letter is saying, I see your lights. I know the drill. My, my ID's out. My hands are on the wheel. You know, uh, he's basically saying like, I, I did everything that I could to avoid confrontation. Um, and so I decided to add strings. Now, in terms of the string arrangement for this, um, I think for verse one, I was thinking like very, uh, very uh, basic pads, meaning that I'm, I'm using like a lot of, of open voicings. So like a lot of, if you're looking at, at a chord, like, you know, three, five, seven, nine. Um, that's like a really common string voicing and a really common piano voicing as well. Um, and I'm just pulling it up right now. Um, it's really great because, you know, when you, when you have like big open spread voicings like this in strings and they're not too high in the register, it doesn't just, dis dis doesn't distract from everything else that's going on. It, it blends well with the piano and it's not taking away from what's going on in the vocals. When I think of all the things that I'm nearing at family barbecues and my other smile, it's gone because of you. One thing I want to add about these strings, too, 
Um, so the strings are all played by one person. <laughs> it's all played by my friend Hannah. She's an amazing violinist. Um, and if you see here, Hannah dubbed herself one, two, three, four, five, six, six times. Um, so twice on violin one, twice on violin two, and then twice on viola. Um, and then what I did was I took what she uh, played and then uh, I also uh, created orchestral parts using a sample library that I have. So I played them on the keyboard. Um, and this is uh, the BBC Symphony uh, Orchestra from you know Spitfire Strings and it's $1,000. <laughs> and so it's, it's a really high quality uh, sample library which is why it can mix uh, so well with real instruments. So if I'm listening to uh, only Hannah's strings, they sound like this. You know, it sounds really great. And then if I listen and isolate just the sample library, it sounds like this. So I have them kind of tucked below Hannah, um, and it's really just adding uh, depth. We're getting, you know, phenomenal players from the BBC, and you're, you're getting the sound of, of, you know, that beautiful concert hall that they record in, um, as opposed to just, you know, Hannah's bedroom where she records. And when you put them together, Because of you, because of you, dear blue, because of you, dear blue. So another compositional element and an arrangement element as well. Um, up to this point, we, the only time we've, we've ever addressed your blues to call the police officer by their name. Um, and, you know, now we've come to this part of the song where I'm finally saying, my mother's smile uh, is gone because of you, because of you, dear blue. Um, so it's, you know, very pointed and it's, uh, when you get to this part, this part, it's, you know, I'm placing blame. I'm like, you've done this. Um, and so now every time I, I, I kind of get to this part, and it happens every time we get to this part in the song, um, I want it to create tension. So, you know, if I, if I reference the score here, uh, yeah, it's like it's happening like right here, you know? So you have like this F minor six over G which is gonna give you like a very suspended feeling. Uh, then it you know, resolves like this E flat major seven to D minor seven, which is gonna be like a nice release of that tension. And then we have that tension again and it resolves to the back of the song. So when you listen to it in context. So here's the tension. Because of you, dear blue. Nice resolve and then the tension again. Because of you. So the harmony is following the lyric there, which is really, you know, common with songwriters. Everyone from Ellington does it to uh, Burt Bacharach. So <laughs> making sure that the harmony follows the, the tension of the lyric. I'm here to rap. So um, obviously this is when the full band uh, enters and it's helping us propel uh, the music forward. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> I guess uh, in terms of like being an arranger, you know, usually when I'm just putting pen to paper or, you know, mouse to Sibelius, um, I'm thinking about how I can create layers. But when you're also producing it and you have like a logic session, it gives you a lot more control um, over what the final product is. So like, you know, just like the bass sound that's being used, um, you know, it's basically like a compilation of three different basses playing at the same time. There's like this sub bass that's happening um, under uh, the upright bass because I still wanted that element. So like the upright bass is being used less as like, uh, you know, holding down the bass notes because we already have the Moog doing that. It's being used more like uh, a part of the, the inner melodic structure. It's like dance playing a lot of counterpoint um, and it just makes things more interesting. Um, in terms of like the drum sound, you know, what's really cool is that when I built the drum sound for this, because I'm a drummer, like, you know, people expect for it to just be like going crazy all the time. That's not what's happening. Um, 
But if you if you isolate everything, like for one, the the percussion sound is uh, a mix of something that's going on in the guitar and something that I'm I'm physically playing on the drums. So if I listen and I isolate just the guitar, you'll hear that the guitar is being very percussive. And this comes from Armand literally banging his guitar. So that adds a lot of uh, character to the drum sound. Um, and I didn't tell him to do that. He just naturally did that because he's a genius. <laughs> um, so when I take that and I add that into the actual uh, drum kit, you know. So I thought that this sounded a bit thin. So what I did was I have, you know, a, a room full of snares. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have nine snares just, you know, in my corner right now. So I recorded a bunch of different snare drums and uh, that kind of filled it out for me. It makes like this really fat snare and it's really like four snares put together. And then on top of that, you know, I pulled a Quincy Jones <laughs> and uh, I just started playing like a bunch of different percussion instruments around my, around my apartment. And just automatically adds more groove. Fear and though I promised not to be unfair. So here's a really common concept in, arra in arranging and also string writing. Um, so before when I had the strings enter, um, I was really trying to keep them out of the way. So they were in a low register, they were playing big open voicings. Um, and that was their function. Their function was to be a pad. Um, and their function here when they come in is, is very different. Um, so if I refer to the score again, um, you can see that here the strings are not only like you know way up high you know we have this high a right here um but also the strings are, are essentially playing in unison so you have violin one and violin two like up the octave violin uh, i'm sorry viola down the octave and then cello an octave below that so it creates like this really nice uh hollywood quote unquote like you know old school hollywood sound when that happens um, and, you know, it, it can carry a lot of beautiful melodic material and convey uh, that same sort of like, you know, emotional, emotional feeling we get when we watch like an old Hollywood romance scene. Um, and beyond that, you know, Hannah was playing lots of things, uh, portamento, which means it's a, it's a string technique uh, where you slide from one note to the next. Um, and when you play things portamento, again, it kind of recalls those those feelings of just like ah oh, that that lushness that we all know. So. Oh, and have you thought about that night? So like here. And how you fear it's all my life. It's if I isolate that, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they want to spend a lot of time. Uh, I'm guilty of this, uh, figuring out like really amazing string voicings and, and counterpoint within the inner strings uh, that work well with everything that's going on. But sometimes just writing in unison for everyone who's like, I don't know how to write string parts. Sometimes writing in unison is honestly the answer. Um, That's so beautiful, and it took, you know, five minutes to write that line. <laughs> so, uh, as opposed to like an hour figuring out some really crazy uh, counterpoint. So, uh, yeah. Again, strings in unison. I 
and again, you can see the strings go back to like that pad material. They're going back to pad material here to kind of get out of the way uh, of the vocal and the other things that are going on in the track. So again, because it's you know a recording, basically Lucas, who is actually married to the one and only uh, Miss Roxy Koss, uh, Lucas sent me like three tenor solos and was like, choose whichever one you like, and I liked all of them. So I basically cut them up and I <laughs> used all three in bits and pieces. And this is a very you know live thing to do. Um, where you would have everyone drop out. So again, going back to like arranging and orchestration, um, what happens now is that we're going to build and we're going to layer everything to create tension. So when we, when we start off, there's percussion comes in, the drums come in, um, and we have synths and piano in at first. So that's the only harmony that's really happening. It's just right here. Cool, so now we're gonna add, now we add this layer of strings. Um, and I think they're playing low at this point. Yeah, so we add this layer of strings uh, playing in a low register. Um, and they're playing harmony again, they aren't in unison, so they're very much padded and out of the way. They're using uh, more close voicings this time, uh, just so I can create more crunch and more tension uh, within the uh, inner workings, and there's some counterpoint happening as well. And then beyond that, I made a choir of myself. <laughs> uh, so I, I made like the Brian choir, and we're singing and creating tension down here. And everyone's really nicely tucked. I call this the like the Lion King attack. Just like oh. it's something that's used all the time. The Lion King, Lion King, to uh, to accentuate like a punch. So that's what's happening. Is my favorite part. I thought, what if we just like put an electronic like you know, drop in this song, because <laughs> why not? Cool, so when we have uh, kind of like a motif that's repeating over and over because that entire section is only like an eight bar phrase and then it extends, um, we have to figure out devices and, and figure out ways to uh, make things grow, make things develop. And this was just like the way that, that I did it. So just creating lots and lots of layers. Um, and then, you know, I feel like this last verse is really, uh, it's really emotional. Um, and like still to this day, like I can't get, I can't get through this part without singing, without crying. Um, and so I wanted everything to drop out. That's all I hope you've learned from this letter I wrote. And the next time that a brown boy frightens you. Remember me, dear blue. So having that, originally there were like strings and uh, other things kind of happening. 
like all these colors and the drums and cymbals. Um, and I just ultimately decided that it didn't need it. Like, you know, uh, there's this like this thing that we always go back to, especially in like college jazz improv classes where it's like, you have to respect the lyric, you have to know the lyric, you know? And it felt like honestly one of those moments where the lyric should be kind of the most important thing. Um, so yeah, that is, <laughs> that's kind of like a, a really brief overview of like the arrangement, the composition elements of it, the production elements of, of Dear Blue. So yeah. Um, are there any immediate questions right now before I turn it over to Roxy? I would guess that the first one is, is do you have that song available anywhere? Yeah, the song is available on Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere you listen to music. And then uh, we also just recorded a live video of it. Uh, it's kind of like a stripped down video for Lift Every Vote that's on YouTube. Awesome. Um, why don't we get into uh, Roxy's portion? And then I think there are some other questions um, that we may come back to because they may pertain to sort of everybody. Um, so real quick, let me introduce our, our second panelist tonight, um, musician, composer, band leader, educator, and activist Roxy Koss has performed around the world headlining at the Newport Jazz Festival, the Melbourne Big Band Festival, New York City Winter Jazz Fest, Earshot Jazz Festival, San Jose Jazz Summerfest, the Jazz Standard and Jazz Showcase a recipient of an ASCAP Young Jazz Composer Award. She has performed as a side musician with Clark Terry, Billy Kay, Maurice Hines, Rufus Reed, Lewis Hayes, and the Diva Jazz Orchestra. Uh, Roxy is also on the board of directors for the Jazz Education Network. Jen is on faculty at the Juilliard School and the New, the New School BMCC and is the founder of Women in Jazz Organization, Weijo. Um, welcome again, Roxy. So great to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me here. It's been really fun. I'm enjoying this sort of residency feel, even though we're on uh, Zoom. So thank you for those of you who tuned in. And um, yeah, thank you to Brian for that. Um, such a powerful composition. And it's really cool to get to see the behind the scenes. Like, how, does, how do musicians think about their music? Because I talk about my own music in this type of setting a lot, but I don't often get a chance to hear my peers talking about their music. And I, it's interesting to see you know, what differs and what's the same. So I think you all will, will see some of that too as I start to show you my process a little bit. Um, and I think you know, I was trying to decide between a few compositions in terms of how to walk you through my process. Um, but after uh, Brian's choice, I feel like there's only one choice I can pick, which is Mr. President. Um, which is a song that I wrote uh, actually four years ago now. Um, and I feel is great timing today to talk about this this composition. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, it's, you know, thinking about the art form of jazz, um, to me, jazz is a protest music. It um, It is a music that was created by Black Americans and uh, it's, it's really America's art form. And when we think about the conditions in which it was created, um, it came from a system of oppression that led to uh, people to feel empowered and to, you know, sort of cathartically take ownership of, of themselves and their situation and create something beautiful out of that. When we talk about what are the blues, uh, the blues, the blues is having the blues, but it's also if you sing the blues or you play the blues, you you start to feel better. And, you know, this is part of what jazz is. So I really appreciate, um, you know, music that has a message. And not every composition of mine is so literal as the one that we're about to look at. But um, I guess I, I think that's important to say up front because I try to be very honest with my compositions in terms of what am I dealing with in my everyday life, in my personal life, in my career, in my whatever music uh, journey that I can communicate to the audience. Because when I go out there to step on stage or, you know, to go to record, um, ultimately for me, it's instrumental music. I don't sing. So without the lyric, 
how do I portray something that an audience can connect to in an art form that many are disconnected from in this day and age? People are not uh, educated in jazz, and it's a little bit um, more of an intellectual art form than the popular music that we're hearing these days. And so uh, I find it very important to have a strong message behind my music and to know what the intent is before sitting down to write it. Um, so in my general uh, you know, compositional process, I usually keep a list in my phone of ideas that pop up throughout my life. Like if I go hear a, a band and I feel inspired or if I'm making dinner and I, I have an idea, um, then I write it down on my phone and I sit down at the piano and I look through that list and I say like, what does inspire me right now? And it could be something very general um, or it could be something very specific. And what I mean by that is sometimes I'll say, I'll be working on a musical aspect like, oh, I really want to write a tune that has like, you know, suspended harmony to take one of the things from Brian's tune as an example, um, something technical. But in this case, I sat down and I was just reeling over the politics that were going on and just sort of, you know, what does this man mean to our country? Uh, what is, you know, Donald Trump being Mr. President, what does that mean for us? And what are my emotions about that? And how can I turn that into something musical to connect with people on? And how can I share, you know, whatever, whether it be a cathartic experience or a sad or angry or joyous, what is the intent? So, I, sorry that's long-winded, but I think for me, intent is always at the, the bottom of why I create music and, and how. Um, so I sat down at the piano to write this tune and I was imagining just what are the depths of despair? <laughs> really, like I felt when he won the election and I don't want to get too much into politics, but I do want to get a little bit into politics. Um, I felt that uh, as a woman in jazz, and I talked about this on our last panel last week, um, as a woman in jazz, my everyday experience is usually one of always being aware of your gender. So you're an other and you're aware of that and it clouds uh, people's trust in you, in your experience, in your skill level, in what you have to say. So every time I talk, I'm being questioned and second guessed and judged and criticized. And um, I saw that playing out with the debates of Hillary and Trump. I saw uh, him, you know, talking about women in a derogatory objectifica objectification way where I felt like I identified to that in my experience in music. And so I wanted to connect these things through this composition. So my primary emotion to start with was anger. And I, you'll hear that. And I'm, I, I'm going to play it for you in a second. And um, I wanted to create chaos. And so I actually wrote in an extended free improvisation section at the beginning of the song because I wanted it to start with what I felt in New York City the day that Donald Trump was elected, which is now exactly four years ago, which is crazy. Um, so uh, there was a sense of mourning and anger and what, like questioning. So I wanted to portray that through the music, sort of like not an exact direction given to the band, um, a minor key that felt grounded, uh, yet not resolved. You know, some minor keys sort of sit and they just sit there, but this one doesn't. And um, from there, there's a couple storylines that, uh, that uh, unravel, but I want to play it for you first and then I'll explain what those are. So I'm going to play um, Mr. President and I'm going to play it into where I take the solo and then I'm going to just pause it for time's sake. Um, so let me share my sound.
All right, I cut myself off there. All right, um, so, and I'm gonna put this in the chat here, um, just the link to, um, I actually recorded this whole album as a video recording in the studio live, so you can check out the YouTube videos, um, and that's the link to this particular song. Um, but I wanna pull up the score and kind of talk you through a little bit. So give me a second to pull this screen share up for this application. Okay, so this entire first like 30 seconds to a minute of free improvisation is really just notated like one chord. And I just said play free. Um, and so we really take it different directions when we play it live. Um, but we kind of found like the vibe that we wanted for that as a band. And in general, most of, most of the time these days, I do compose for my quintet. I have a working band, the Roxy Cross Quintet. And so it's kind of shaped how I've started to compose because rather than just like having an amorphous random composition that you create, it's really written for these specific people. Um, Alex Wentz on guitar, Miki Yamanaka on piano and keyboards, uh, Rick Rosato on bass and Jimmy McBride on drums. And uh, I'll, you know, sometimes I play soprano, uh, very rarely bass clarinet, but usually tenor. And um, so I have these five voices that I'm thinking of when I'm writing. And so there is an element of arrangement that enters my mind kind of from the beginning of my compositional process. Um, so as I said, I wanted to create that chaos that you heard at the beginning. And out of that, it sort of lands with a crash, but it's not resolved, right? We, we stay in that minor vibe and this piano quarter note comes out of it. And so it's just quarter notes. And this type of quarter note to me, it kind of comes from a hip hop quarter note when you have it on piano. And um, I tend to have that in a few of my compositions. And I do like to mix uh, styles as you've probably heard. Um, it also starts to set up what becomes sort of a dirge death march and i it i think on my mind was like the star wars you know em the emperor's march um darth vader <laughs> theme song here um and so that's literally what i told jimmy was like i want that sort of march on the snare and um so it becomes very uh dirge like and then we had the bowed bass we have the arco bass and um i don't often write that in for my band um rick doesn't even bring a bow unless i absolutely demand it of him but um i think that you know it really creates that sort of somber sense to to express it that way okay so as we build this first section i wanted it to turn into more of a ballad almost like over the death march so the saxophone i wanted it to be really pretty at first and it, it starts as like kind of similar to brian it's like okay we got the anger out of the way and i'm left with sadness and loneliness so it's just the saxophone stark there's not a lot going on the rhythm section is not supposed to get in the way it's just a pad for me to sort of it's almost like a voice would sing and and so there's a nice amount of reverb and I, I used like a softer tone to express this. And I think, you know, when we talk about jazz or this, you know, both of the things that Brian and I are talking about today, these tunes, um, the expression of it is part of the composition, you know, because you could read this piece of music, this score that I have, and it could sound completely different if you approach it in a different way. But the way you play it really makes the most difference out of anything. Okay, so, um, I've got the saxophone here just on on its own as the solo instrument. And I, I state this melody up front. And then when we get to the end of this section, I it's a similar melody, right? It's like a, a second phrase, question and answer type thing of this melody stated again. Um, but I add the guitar. And at first you can't even really tell because we start in unison, but I, um, I wanted it to be grittier. And so I even, I changed the tone of the way I'm playing and I get more aggressive and more bright and biting. Um, and then we start to bend these notes and really get gross. And it, 
sometimes when we're playing live, it's really out of tune and we just really push into that. Um, so the idea is it's getting more and more tense, more and more tense, more and more tense throughout here. Um, and then you'll notice that at the end of each section from here on out, we start speeding up. And so I, I wrote each of these sections individually and I realized later that they were each at a different tempo. So when I put them together, it was a natural like, oh, we need to do an accelerando into each section because I can't think of one tempo that works for this song. And it actually made sense because it's like chaos, chaos, chaos. It's getting crazier and crazier. Where is this going? How could this possibly keep getting crazier? Which was foreshadowing of the entire uh, last four years, ultimately. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, the other thing that happened was as I got out of this section and into the next one, I realized that I wanted this section to be Latin. And the reason behind this, I actually, this was intentional. I felt like this starts to represent a second theme. So we've got our first theme, which is like the theme of the emperor, <laughs> the death march. And then the second theme comes in. And the second theme represents what I feel like is the reason we ended up there in the first place, which is the news cycle is portraying a sense of normalcy, like everything's fine, la 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 la. Um, and so it's almost like the vapid, uh, shallow um, way that our culture has been going. Uh, I think, you know, materialistic, object focused, oh, I need a, you know, I need a, a blowout and I need, you know, I need the latest uh, cycle class and uh, Mercedes. And so um, this is a distraction from real issues. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a judgment because this is how we deal. This is how we handle what's going on. Um, but this type of way that we treated everything in the news in America created a sense that the behaviors that were happening were normal. And I just don't think that they are. So this musically, I wanted to represent sort of that like character that is like, la, 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 la. So that's the, the way I heard it when I wrote that melody. Um, and so it ended up being sort of like a Latin-y, like quasi-Latin, whatever. Um, and orchestration wise, I did want it to be a different character. So I actually gave Alex, the guitarist, the melody. And I recede into the background here as the counter melody here. And so through that, I start to tell a story where I represent the first character and he represents the second character. Um, then we go back to, uh, we go to, I shouldn't say back, we go to a new, we have now a third character essentially. Uh, which is the the swing this is the first time we break into swing and it feels like a release at first right because you're like oh wow like all of that tension and now we're swinging it feels like a release but it starts to build because we start to get faster and faster and faster and we dump back into this quasi latin which now feels almost hysterical because it's sped up from the first time we heard it and we build and build and build and release again into the fast swing and then we speed up and speed up and speed up even more into the solos. So the idea was by the time we get to the solos, I want it to just feel like, ah, like almost out of control. Like you can't even play that fast. And when we play it live, we play it faster. And it's like, OK, as fast as we can play it. And the idea is spiraling. And then when I finish my solo, um, it goes back into the free section. And I'll play a little bit of that for you. Um, actually, it's it's after Mickey's solo. So I play a solo, then Mickey plays a piano solo, and then we go back to the free.
right, and then from there, we go back to the head. Um, and when we play it live, sometimes we just end there. And actually, we're going to release this on vinyl, this record, and I think I'm going to end it there on the vinyl. <laughs> um, I think that sometimes it just needs to end with, with that, which is not very resolved. Um, but sometimes we go back to the melody, and then I'll play the very end for you. on a on a, a short note um, so okay looking back at the score um, just to get a little more detailed into this so thinking about the five different people playing the music um, some techniques that I often use like I already said like I'll, I'll write a melody for me I'll write melody and give it to either Alex or Mickey you know guitar or piano sometimes I will write harmonies um, so like at this last section, I have the melody, but Alex is playing a harmony, uh, so different notes, but in the same rhythm. Um, the piano only has this melody written for reference. Uh, Mickey likes to see the, you know, the melody so she can comp accordingly. Um, same thing with the drums. Um, and then other times I'll write a counter melody, um, and that's what's going on here. So Alex has this main melody, Ba -da 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 -da. Uh, and I'm playing this background part um, and then sometimes I'll have two melodies going at once anyway so there's different techniques and what I like about the quintet is that we have enough voices that I can really have like five different things going on at once or I can have one thing kind of be the the featured thing and everything else support that like at the beginning of this tune um, at the end of Mickey's solo, you probably heard these chords. And this is a point where I would indicate rhythmic notation for the band um, and the harmony, and then let them decide which notes they choose to use within that structure. Um, and so it's, you know, we're coming out of this fast swing. And so it's the gradual slowdown into the free. Um, and so at the end of this, the DC, we go back to this free section up top. At, on this last chord here, the B minor. So I think even just by like kind of scrolling through this score, you can kind of see into my brain a little bit because I, I write a lot of instructions in here. Um, and I try to give everyone as much information as possible. Like, okay, the bass is joining, that's in the piano part, so that Mickey knows when the bass comes in, we start this new section. And when I come in, that's A, so I write that in the rhythm section part so that they know when I come in, we have to start at A. That's, you know, we don't get lost in the chart, like where are we? Because we, we are coming out of a free section. So this uh, quarter note might extend longer sometimes and that's fine as long as people come in at the right place. Um, the other thing about this tune that I, I laughed at myself about was this theme that you hear in the swing section. Let me find it. Da, da, da. Uh, at the time that I was composing this song, it's just a three note theme, but um, I was listening to a lot of Bjork. I was working on a project with Nick Finzer. We were re recording Bjork tunes with a jazz band. And um, I totally ripped off Bjork without knowing it. Later I realized and was like, oh duh, that's totally a Bjork melody. And it's just three notes. So I obviously took it completely out of context, but I want it play that a little bit so you can hear like sometimes we just have these influences from whatever we're listening to and you might not know how it shows up but um uh, let me find it one second i just find it kind of funny and interesting um and also you know for for jazz students we're i think there's a it's hard to understand when you're young like how is listening to music going to help me or influence me um but it's a language, and so 
if you're listening to something, you're going to start to speak that. You're going to express that from yourself in some way. And the great part about all of that is that you do internalize it and make it your own. So obviously I made this song my own. I didn't just like uh, write a Bjork tune on accident. Um, let me see if I can find this part of the melody. Even the beginning, I didn't realize it. It starts off with the extended tension. All right. So it's, this is the verse, um, and it's not until the chorus. that's that's it it's just that little -da -da -da, and it's straight up in there and and it was not intentional and so that's why i pointed out because it was like you know it's just it, it's interesting and it, it serves the same purpose in her song which is it's tension tension and then it's sort of the release and that becomes the hook that you recognize and it's more consonant and um this served the same purpose which is to go into swing here with a very basic melody three note you know major triad essentially um so yeah that was the only other tidbit about the tune but i think i think that's it unless there's other questions um that's how that tune came to be <laughs> awesome well thank you both uh for sharing that i do have a couple questions here um from from folks uh the first one was just about lyric writing and and Someone was asking, what is a good way to train yourself in writing lyrics? Yeah, I think that writing lyrics is, uh, it's very similar to, to composing music, you know, whatever type, if you're writing jazz, or if you're, you're, you're writing string quartets, or, you know, you're writing for orchestra, um, I think the best way to train yourself to do it is just to do it. Um, I had a teacher named Ben Wolf, and he used to say, write a song every day. Write a song every day, spend 30 minutes on it, just write it. If you don't finish it, it's fine, but just write it and don't judge it. So that, and what he meant by that is like, as you're writing, just put it to paper, don't judge it, and then just put it away. And then come back three months later, six months later, a year later, and look at all the stuff that you've, you've written. Um, and, you know, Stevie Wonder says a similar thing. Uh, there's a great interview where someone's asking him, like, how can you write so much? Like, you've, we can go to one of your concerts and we can sit there for three hours and it's nothing but hits. Like, how can you write that much music? And he's like, oh, that's just a small fraction of all the music that I've written and most of it is bad. <laughs> and just like, these are the good ones, but I just write a lot. So I, I think lyric writing is, is the, the same way. And also in the way that we, you know, something that's amazing is that Roxy and I, both talked about um, pulling from a lot of different influences and, and they weren't just jazz influences they were influences from all over and especially with lyric writing um, I think spending time with like the great American songbook you know there's there's so many times where I'm, I'm inspired by old lyrics or, or, or an old lyric um, spending time with poetry just reading a lot I like to read um, you know even if you're like watching a, a Disney movie you know it's like howard ashman is one of the the greatest lyricists of of all time you know and his lyrics are in little mermaid and beauty and the beast you know and if you actually look at those lyrics you're like wow i don't even know what this means and then you go back and you figure out that it's like something from like a 16th century french chanson and you're like oh okay <laughs> you know so just uh yeah i guess just listening to a lot of 
of, of songs and, and studying, studying the great lyrics. I have never, well, I've written one set of lyrics in my life, so I have no expertise on this, but one thing that I did uh, study in college was um, I was taking poetry and composing songs to the poetry. So even, even beyond just like informing your own lyric writing, um, that might help understand how the music might be set to existing lyrics if you try to write the music to the lyrics. Um, and you could also challenge yourself to do the opposite. Take something that's already written musically and see if there are words that fit to it. Um, but that might be more challenging sometimes because then it has to fit exactly right. Um, and sometimes our brains work differently, so it could start backwards. <laughs> Very cool. Um, someone also asked about, you know, having problems getting ideas that you have in your head out and interpreting them um, into your music. Um, do you have any thoughts, techniques, or, or practices that have helped you with that? I guess, again, just what Brian said, doing it, um, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And I, you know, that's a great question for that particular tune, Mr. President, because I really did have an idea about a person that I wanted to express. Um, and I didn't know how to do that musically. So for me, in general, this is true, but especially this is a great example of how it worked out, which is com composition is like a, a puzzle for me. Um, and so when I sit down to write a composition, whatever idea I have, I literally just poke at the piano until I find the right puzzle piece. And then as soon as you find it, you know, you're like, oh, that's it. There is no question. You just write it down. Um, and so sometimes you have to poke a lot. And that might mean writing, like Brian said, writing out a lot of different things. But then when you find the right one, you know that it's the right one. Um, and so usually I will play some ideas around on the piano and it might be like, oh, I know I want this to be a minor song because I want to start sad or angry. And so I just start finding the right key and then I go from there. And then once you have one piece, it's easier to find the other pieces, right? Like as you get closer to finishing a puzzle, there's only less, there's fewer options to pull from. So it becomes easier. So it's, a, it's the same process for me. And like, for instance, going from one chord to the next, there's only a few possibilities of what might sound good. So once you find the right option, you're like, oh yeah, that's definitely where that has to go next. Sometimes the beginning can be the hardest part of how to express that idea. And so Starting with something concrete can help, um, whether that's like an emotional thing, like, oh, this is a happy tune, it should be a major key, or whether that's like um, a very specific, like, oh, I wanna feature a vocalist, well, I should start with what is their vocal range? Like something very concrete can get you started a lot of times. Yeah, I have a, uh, I have an iPhone little voice note, like six second idea, walking home from the store and I'll have an idea pop into my head and I'll just be like, oh, I don't want to forget this. And I'll sing it into my phone. And there are so many times where like, I'm like tired or whatever. And I'm just laying in bed and an idea will come and I'll be like, oh, I'll remember it in the morning. And then it's gone, <laughs> you know? Um, so just getting it down, even if you, if you don't have access to a piano or you don't have access to manuscript or to finale or whatever, just uh, finding a way to record that idea so that you have it available for later. Um, yeah. And then also being willing to, like as you know, as Roxy just mentioned, like being able to, to play with that idea. Like if you have an idea and it, it doesn't fit, sorry, I don't know what's going on outside. <laughs> All right, it's a lot of motorcycles. <laughs> uh, they've been shooting a movie on my block all week and it's been the most annoying thing ever. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, if you have a melody and you're writing it for a singer and it doesn't fit within their tessitura, it's like being willing to adapt that and, and figure out a new way to use that idea as well. Yeah, being flexible is super important. Sometimes I'll write, I'll write a whole song based on a bass line that I liked, you know. I like, oh, I want to write a, a bass line doubled in the piano and bass and I write it and then it doesn't fit in the bass range and I'm like, well, <laughs> um, so 
you know, definitely being flexible is important when you're composing and finding creative ways to address those problems can sometimes lead to some of your best ideas. Awesome. Um, you were both talking a lot about it, it, through your process and your uh, just being able to sort of pull different things. Brian, you mentioned like old Hollywood, you know, I wanted this particular sound or, you know, the Star Wars or, or whatever it is, <laughs> um, you know, on those various levels, how do you, how have you in your careers sort of studied or gotten to to understand some of these things to the point that you can sort of have them in your toolbox? And when you say, I want this sound, um, you can pull it out and know how you know how to arrange the strings to sound like that or or anything else. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Sure, I'll go first. Um, my answer is not. I I don't know if I should say it, which is I haven't. <laughs> um, I, I I've largely composed on it in an organic, intuitive way. Um, in fact, the better I get at understanding music theory, the harder it can be for me to compose sometimes. I used to compose from a very young age, like, I don't know, age five. And there's something about sitting down at the piano, not understanding anything about music and just finding sounds that I liked. And so I challenge myself nowadays to actually sit down and try to play things. That's why I said poke out, like without thinking, like, can I play a shape without trying to think about what shape it is. It's harder and harder as you get to understand music theory better. Um, so sometimes it's about really going into a place in my brain that I don't typically go into and using my imagination in a way that I, it's almost like being a kid. Like, how do I create a sonic representation of this image I have? Um, then there's other times on the flip side where the more you understand the easier it's, it is to access something specific that you know about so like oh i want to create this sort of like happy but crunchy sound well lydian is my obvious first go-to and so i'm going to try that out so that that part of the process can be quicker for me rather than before if i didn't know what that shape was i hadn't studied it it would take me a lot longer to find those sounds. I would still probably find them, but it would take me forever to find them and I wouldn't understand it as easily. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, those references like Bjork was not intentional, whereas like the Star Wars was. So I had the knowledge of in, the, in that specific instance, because there are so many infinite possibilities with this co concept we're talking about. Um, I knew that the, the history of a march that marches, like I mentioned, dirges, like this is a part of jazz music as well. It's part of like, um, I would say like military music. What is that? What is that? Like, uh, it's going to war. And like, what, what is the history of that in our world? Like drums were like the first instrument aside from the voice, right? So there's such a history of these instruments. And so if you understand music and you study music, those are just things that you learn about. And I don't think for me that these are intentional things, whereas studying harmony is intentional or studying, you know, rhythmic uh, patterns or time signatures. These are things that are intentionally studied, but there's other things that just sort of you learn along the way that are maybe more important sometimes to just understanding music as a, a whole of a, a language to express your ideas. Yeah, I, I think it is also really similar to learning about improvisation um, in a way. Whereas when you talk about studying a musician who you admire, you're often pointed in the direction of also studying who inspired them, you know? So, you know, in my case, I may have grown up, we talk about movie music, I may have grown up listening to, you know, The Incredibles or whatever the movies were when I was a kid and I would hear, a Randy Newman score, I hear a Michael Giacchino score. And then, you know, from exploring that, it would be like, well, who orchestrated this? You know, who orchestrated the notebook? And then you're like, okay, it was this guy, Brad Dector. And it's like, oh, wow, his son is a guitar player, Graham Dector. Oh, he's a jazz musician. He plays with Clayton Hamilton. Clayton Hamilton, John Clayton. Oh, he's also an orchestrator. Let me check out his big band writing. Oh, wow, this is a wonderful string. Oh, wow, he did the national anthem for Whitney Houston. Everyone knows that arranger. You know, so like, 
just doing that, you, you'll open up a web of possibilities for yourself and you have all these different references. Like, you know, the way that people wrote for, for film and television from 1940 is very different than the way that they wrote in 1950, which is different than they wrote in 1955, which is different from the, the way that they wrote in the 60s, you know. So the more that you delve into it, you know, the, the deeper and the greater of the understanding you'll, you'll have, you know. And really, even all of that, you know, can be traced back to like every orchestrator, you know, and has spent time with the Rimsky Korsakov book. It's like that's kind of just like square one, like Rimsky Korsakov, and then lots of time in the library checking out these scores with with the CDs, you know, or the accompanying music that that goes along with them. And you know, I'll I'll get nerdy sometimes, you know, especially when we had lots of time at the beginning of COVID and like. You know, I would make a New York Public Library run knowing that they're going to close very soon and just check out as many scores as I can and then just, like, send voice notes to my friends like, I can't believe Stravinsky played this in 1911, <laughs> you know? And they're just like, all right, thanks for sending that to us. Um, but, yeah, just, just trying to find lots and lots of, of references and, and dive deeper into why people made decisions you know and especially when you when sorry i keep going back to the orchestra but when you talk about the orchestra it's like the way that you know a clarinet and an oboe and you know two violas sound together is very different if you take one of them away and add a bassoon if you take one away and you you add elements of brass or you know if you have like a, a piccolo and it's being doubled with like xylophone you know, like all these things give you different sounds and different textures which are, are really common to our ears because we hear them all the time, all over various forms of media. So just learning how, which combinations work and, and uh, how to best utilize them. Definitely, and I, I just wanted to add that, you know, Brian, like Brian, you have this expertise in orchestration and orchestra that I have no expertise in, I have no knowledge in, but the same, the same concepts apply and, you know, my most of my time spent writing and arranging is for my quintet and so finding what you're describing um sometimes is easier sometimes it's more challenging because it's more of a known factor there's less uh you know moving parts um so if i'm trying to come up with like you know like i was talking about with matching the tenor and the guitar and sometimes it could sound like one person like you can't even tell the guitar comes in and other times you know i'll utilize like guitar effects like distortion or delay or all, all the things that guitar can do because it's an electric instrument um, and even post-production things like Brian was talking about but also like I added tons of like reverb and weird stuff on that free section of the saxophone because I wanted it to be really eerie so getting to know intimately each instrument that you're writing for and its capabilities including range um, timbres um, you know, techniques, articulations, all these types of things um, can can give you more options. So even within a quintet, I feel like there's infinite possibilities in terms of orchestration because you have five people, but you can crisscross and match and have one or five or anything. Um, and so it can be really fun. And we haven't talked too much about small, even smaller groups, but even within a duo or a trio, you have that capability to really explore all those options yeah I, I like this next question if you want to just jump in um, how do you think about notation when your music goes beyond what is standard for jazz how do you communicate your ideas to your musicians um, that's a great question I I mentioned like the hip-hop piano quarter note thing and I think that's a great place to start which is I remember writing that the first time I wrote that out it was very intentional. I asked my pianist uh, at the time, you know, can you play this? I want this articulated like uh, Dr. Dre, like West Coast hip hop. And he had no, exactly. And Brian knows immediately what that means. And so it's just like anything else. If you're familiar with it, just saying that is enough. You don't have to like write it musically a certain way. You don't have to necessarily write the staccato, like the 
staccato accent the way it might be notated properly. You could just say that to somebody. And I think most of the time that's what happens. But in this case, the pianist had no idea what that reference was. Um, so I did, I had to think about like, well, what what is the piano player playing in that recording that I'm referring to? Like, um, so as you go through that process, you will learn. You'll be like, oh, I need this specific accent or you know, this is how they got that sound in the synth or, you know, whatever it may be. I think just trial and error has taught me more than anything. There's no right way to approach that stuff. But again, music is a language. So the more vocabulary you have, the easier it is to express yourself more fully in depth in, you know, deeper ways, meaning more meaningful ways, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Um what Roxy's saying about like the, the West Coast hip hop thing, it's like I instantly knew that reference, but maybe some people would not know that reference. And it goes back to knowing your musicians. You know, again, with Dear Blue, even though it has when you look at the track, it's like sixty tracks or something. You know, it's it was written with my five people that I play with all the time. You know, I know them so intimately, just like Roxy's talking about writing for a working band. It's like this is my working band. Um and I, I think that I know, I know for a fact that they know what I want most of the time. So I trust them. I trust them enough to just give them a lead sheet. I know that they're going to give me what I want. And I intentionally build bands that have people with different strengths and different weaknesses. You know, um, it's like Lucas it has this like wealth of of theoretical knowledge and he can play all up and down the horn and he can approach things from like super angular harmonic approach um which is very different than like anthony hervey who he's paired with all the time where it's like anthony's like church born and bred and it's like you know he's gonna <laughs> like take this but he also has like this you know winton wintonian uh approach also where it's like lots of leaps and bounds in the way that he plays um and when i talk about like extended members of my band it's like the way that natalie tannenbaum functions within my within my band is very different than the way that matisse picard you know functions and they're both amazing pianists it's like natalie it kind of has like this unlimited facility on the instrument that's kind of unmatched by <laughs> really anyone that i can think of she can do anything uh in terms of just she can sight read an entire orchestra score like she she can do anything and like what matisse can can bring in terms of just like synth and like on this he's playing like three different synths and and a uh, harmonic approach and and again kind of digging into like church and, and roots and then play like americana and all these different genres that he's he knows so intimately so it's like everyone has different strengths and weaknesses and oftentimes if someone is unfamiliar with something that that I'm trying to get them uh, to do, then I'll just give them a recording and they'll go and figure it out. Um, so, you know, I, I think less and less and less about notation uh, when I don't have to, uh, because writing something on paper is just not as good as, as using your using your ears. Um, you know, when I'm writing for string players, it's like I most of the time I have to write it out. You know, or I have to verbally try to explain it to them, but it ha I need us colenio. Yeah, exactly. Portamento, that's what that needs to be. Right. Ricochet bowing, please. You know, it ha I have to write physically write the bowings in that they should be using so that they they can all match in terms of articulation. So uh, it's very type A <laughs> arranging uh, as opposed to just being like, all right, everybody do your thing. I know what you do. I know you're going to do a great job. So. And like, you know, knowing your own references helps. Like I was teaching my Juilliard ensemble and one of my students had written into their arrangement um, a, a feel change, a groove change. And it just said, uh, Woody and you. And the drummers were like, what do I play there? And in two seconds, I had the Dizzy Gillespie version pulled up on my phone and played it. And it was the exact groove that the, the, stu the other student, the composer had intended. Um, and so just knowing the history, knowing your, knowing your references, and we all have different ones, obviously, Brian and I are going to vary, everybody's going to vary, uh, but whatever you're trying to express, make sure that you are, yeah, a, a, 
a clip of audio is worth a thousand notations. <laughs>